Charlotte, thanks so much for coming in today and talking to us about corporate governance. The first question I wanted to ask was around the challenges and benefits for companies wanting to implement best practice in corporate governance. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I would say that, that many boards would like to follow best practice, but somehow they don't quite get, uh, get their heads around what is it actually. It's, not, it's really not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward uh, business to follow. It's all about common sense. Um, a lot of the challenges is that people are not focusing on it. Uh, many people are afraid that they're following box ticking exercises, but you kind of have to own it, you have to have it in your heart and just do it as a natural part of how you run a board. Uh, but the benefits are obviously huge. I mean, there's a significant benefits for boards for to just follow uh, best practice corporate governance in a way where it makes it easier for them to make the right decisions. It makes the whole thing much more efficient. Uh, and that decision-making process and that efficiency actually carries down throughout the organisation, which are some of the huge benefits as well, the tone from the top. What do you think are the knock-on benefits for that company in adopting best practice? Well, I think what often happens with boards and what I see uh, when I work with boards is that a lot of the directors forget the wider responsibility they have and the wider amount of stakeholders they have in a company. When you are on the board of a company, that company sits in a country with people of that country and with a government and really their responsibility lies to that wider picture. So for every decision you make, you have to take that wider picture into, into account as well. It's like a double and triple bottom line if you want. It's If you've got the best of the company but if if that company hasn't got an infrastructure to live in which is the people and the country and the government that it, in that country then it hasn't got a life at all and I think that's often forgotten and that needs to be, be on the forefront of people's minds. So it's about ultimate corporate responsibility in terms of company and environment. Absolutely that's uh, that's key we talk a lot about CSR corporate responsibility generally and I think, again, for some, it becomes a box-ticking exercise where it should actually just be something you naturally have in your leadership skills because that is what it means to be a board member. You hold yourself out as a leader and you serve the board, but you don't only serve the board, you serve all the stakeholders that's involved with the company uh, in general. And it's bearing that in mind. What do you think are the other factors that, that make uh, a really good non-exec director? A non-exec director has to have full clarity of what he or she brings to the board. What are the skills and the attributes that you actually bring to the board? Uh, so I think the skills that, that non-exec directors have to have, that the three basic skills, you have to have strategic thinking, you know, knowledge of corporate governance and basic knowledge of accounts. You don't have to be an accountant, but you have to understand what's a balance sheet, uh, what's P&L and the, the numbers, you know, why are we discussing solvency and stuff like that. Uh, that has to be in place before you even consider being a board member. And in terms of the uh, the approach, I guess, um, and being willing to explore and to uh, sort of to give an awful lot of yourself to the board, mm -hmm. um, is that an important aspect? I think it's key. So the the whole personal way of how you run, you can't really sit on a board for self-serving reasons. You have to serve others. That is what you're there for. You serve as a board member. I think the word serve is quite important and again one to keep in mind. Uh, you serve not only the board and the company but also the wider public. Uh, and again, we do see examples of board members forgetting that and getting very focused just on the company and what's best for the company. But it's the bigger picture. Uh, when, the, when we do what's best for the bigger picture, it becomes better for everybody. So it's asking questions, I suppose, and being willing to actually start exploring and, and maybe not always being the person that's liked, if you like. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in the end of the day, it's actually not always about how much knowledge do you hold. It's about do you ask the right questions, as you were rightly saying. Um, Asking the right questions and keep asking them until you get an answer you can understand is key. You don't have to have all the knowledge as a board member at all, but you do need to ask the questions. And you do need to ensure that it's evidence that you've been asking those questions and what the answers to them were. Tell us about the board apprenticeship process. So um, Board Apprentice uh, is, is a charity I run that basically develops board members uh, to sit on boards, but diverse board members board members different from the ones uh, that are the majority of board members today. And that obviously differs from country to country. We're in eight different countries so far. We have a vision of being global. So the kind of diversity you would look for in China is different to the kind of diversity we look for in the UK. Um, the process is we, we select them 
uh, according to what do they have sufficient knowledge in the areas I already mentioned, which is account accountancy, corporate governance, um, and strategic thinking. If they have enough information to hold themselves at board level with that, then we will pass them through. We have a process that's the same everywhere we go. Everybody gets asked the same questions. Um, everybody has the same amount of time. We're not that interested in sort of their family background and all these things. If people want to be board members, we like to help them get developed into being that. We do keep an eye on whether they are diverse or not, uh, as that's one of the key reasons we are there. But in the end of the day, the final decision to go onto a board will be taken by the board themselves. How do you perceive diversity? Well, we see it as much broader than gender diversity. I think gender diversity is really something I can't spend too much time talking about anymore, just make it happen. Uh, the diversity that I think board needs is, is, a, is a way of being and a background and whatever you can put into the board where you can see with all eyes. So if we imagine that we have a board body, uh, that body has to have all the eyes to see with. And that's really sort of one of the things that I keep banging on about because I think that really tells you what it is you're looking for. So if you have a company that needs technology knowledge, but you have nobody on the board who has any technology knowledge, you've got to make sure that someone comes in with that set of eyes that can bring the input and ask the questions in that area that the current board members can't. That's when you look for the different skill gaps that a board might have. You will make sure that there are certain areas that are fully covered. How important is the way somebody thinks and where they've been in their lives and what their experiences have been? It's, it's very important and it's definitely something we take into account as well. Uh, the different diversities uh, encompasses like uh, generational diversity, neurodiversity. Neurodiversity is an interesting one that has been brought up uh, on many occasions. Uh, the, the neurodiverse people tend to have a different wiring, or not tend to, do have a different wiring from the neurotypical people in that they will think very differently, think out of the box, say, and possibly not the ones that will follow the standard rules, which for schools is very difficult, so a lot might not do well in schools, but what they, once they mature, and that way of thinking is adding a lot of strength onto any decision-making process they take part of. So that way of thinking out of the box and seeing opportunities and risks that, that neurotypical people wouldn't necessarily have their eyes on is key, and having one person like that on a board could make a significant difference to that company. That's very interesting because I would imagine that in the past some of those people may have been marginalised from the corporate environment. Unfortunately they, they still are, uh, but that depends on how wide we see the whole spectrum of neurodiversity. If we see it in the widest, there is probably a large amount of people that are not even classified as neurodiverse, but who are and who are out there um, making changes and actually pushing society in a way that that wouldn't have happened if you just follow the rules all the time. Following the rules is good, but one day someone said, actually, I don't want to carry, let me make a wheel instead. You know, someone has these kind of aha moments all the time, and I think that's what you want to capture with bringing neurodiverse people onto boards. From your international experience, what are the cultural and geographical differences in terms of the way people approach corporate governance? Absolutely. There seem to be, be quite a lot of differences. I've travelled around the world talking about governance and interacting with governance, and I was recently in Rwanda to, to work with a group of 30 African politicians from, from different countries in Africa. And it was incredible how they were so open and so engaged in the whole process and in our discussions and and with the tools that I was providing for them where they, they could really see that it made a difference, but they wanted to make a difference, they wanted to make it better, as opposed to when I speak in the UK, where people go a bit, oh, call for governance, yawn, where, you know, that, that kind of engagement doesn't really come. And I really enjoy working with people that has a good natural interest in doing a better job it's much, much more rewarding. And that's certainly what I found in Rwanda. And equally, I suppose, if they do a better job, they'll be more successful, their country will be more successful. Absolutely. It all goes together. And it's, I think it's getting that message across that actually that all goes together. It is about making not just your company successful. If you make a bank successful, but the financial system falls over, you haven't got a bank. What a surprise. It, it, you just got to make sure that, that you properly have your mindset on that bigger picture. So what's next for you? Well, well, you never know, anything can happen. <laughs> I am sort of beginning to look at the, at the much bigger picture. My vision is to get governance all over the world to become better, to find ways of having a scalable um, impact 
where it's, it, I can sit in Jersey and still have impact in other countries. So doing an e-learning uh, platform where we bring the governance and more practical aspects of, of best practice governance out. Um, but also looking a little bit more towards governments and how they run, um, because I think it's very, very hard to get more diversity onto boards if we have governments that are very undiverse. So in a sense, of the, the Court of Ministers is like another company board, but that company is the country, and they really do need to lead by example. The tone from the top is, is, is key, and the governments are actually the tone from the very top. So if they want to tell boards to be more diverse, but they can't manage to be themselves, then things are going to happen very slowly. Charlotte, thanks so much for coming. You have a, a huge mandate, uh, but one that's incredibly important. Thank you very much for spending the time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you.